Mm-hmm. Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy. And I'm Pastor Chris Johnson. This is your word at the middle of the week, and we are studying Exodus chapter 11, and hopefully chapter 12 as well. I think we'll get into that a little bit today as we finish up the plagues that God has been sending on the people of Israel. The people of Israel are slaves in Egypt. God has sent Moses to lead them out of bondage into the freedom of the promised land eventually, but first Moses and God have to contend with Pharaoh. And the way that they're doing that is through the sending of these plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Anything we need to chat about before we get started, mm-hmm. Pastor Johnson? Um, maybe a brief word about number. We talked about that very briefly last week. You know, why why 10? Uh, why not 7? 7 mm-hmm. is, is, a, is a very biblical number. 40, we hear about 40 quite a bit. 3. 40 um, plagues, that would be horrific. 40 plagues, yeah, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be almost... Uh, overkill, so to speak, but, um, the 10, what, 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 what is about the number 10 that is so significant to mm-hmm. pastor? Well, there's a couple of ways it's used in Holy scripture. Um, sometimes just used to, to be a multiple of things, but, um, like seven like, times, yeah, 10, seven times 10. And... So to show the fullness, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think 10 often is used as a full number, mm-hmm. the fullness of God's wrath here is being poured out on Egypt. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Yeah. No, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, you have the, like, in Revelation, the 12 times 12 times, times 100, 100 is a multiple of 10. Right. Definitely getting at the fullness aspect. 12 times 12 times 10 times 10. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the fullness of God's anger and wrath against Pharaoh for enslaving his people, Israel. and it's interesting, you know, uh, God, God favors Israel. So he does not like this slavery because he has favored Israel and he has a destiny for Israel. But at the same time, um, he did not allow the Israelites to take slaves when they conquered the promised land, for example. Mm-hmm. He did not allow them to take slaves. Um, he did not, um, uh, he did not allow that to become a, a practice in Israel to the same same extent here right in Egypt yeah there would be like indentured <laughs> servants yeah but they, they would mainly be Israelites who had fallen into debt kind of a thing right so much slaves of other nations and then when when the gospel comes we see later on like in the Paul in the letter to Philemon uh, where Paul is talking to a rich man Philemon about his escaped slave Onesimus um, he, he, he sends Onesimus, Onesimus back, Onesimus back, but he says, I now send him back to you as a brother so that the, the bond there of master and slave remains in a technical sense, but for Paul that has changed, mm-hmm. uh, and, and become more than that has become a free relationship of, of brotherhood as well. So I, you know, there's a, there is a resistance here, not just, I think, to, Israel being enslaved, but to the institution of slavery mm-hmm. itself. Absolutely. All right. Well, would you read for us the entire 11th chapter, Pastor Johnson? Yep. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he sent out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, it's a very solemn moment. Uh, the die is cast. And Pharaoh has resisted again because the Lord has hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so the Lord is making his wonder known. I mean, this is a pattern we've seen over and over and over again. But now, um, now this is the end. This is one, one last plague, and it is uh, a doozy, as it were. I mean, the firstborn from not just the firstborn of Pharaoh, but also down to the firstborn of all the cattle. Hmm. I mean... Even the animals, and we see this type of thing also, like in the prophet, uh, the prophet Jonah, right, mm -hmm. uh, where he goes to Nineveh, and even you know, cats and dogs are in sackcloth, and right? Ashes, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, when when the Lord's uh, wrath comes upon a nation, uh, it's a nation. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a it's a wrath that that comes against the whole nation. The whole nation is implicated mm -hmm. in a thing here. Uh, there's definitely a, a national identity that's taken whole. Uh, and so it's not just as though, well, Pharaoh alone is going to suffer here, but it's it's all the people. Mm -hmm. um, what should we say about yeah. that? And, and you see that thread throughout all of Scripture. I you mean, do. You go right back to, to Genesis, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they, you know, they disobeyed the word of the Lord, and from them the fall of the human race, you know, cascaded from there. The whole, the whole race. Yeah, and so Adam was the figurehead of the human race, and as goes the head, so goes the rest of the body. Right. Um, we see it in another case, for example, in uh, 1 Samuel 17, I think it is, uh, where there mm -hmm. is David getting ready to fight Goliath. And here these two warriors are going to battle. David, not much of a warrior, of course. But these two representatives represent their nations, um, David representing Israel and uh, Goliath representing the Philistines. Mm -hmm. And the winner of that battle would take over the other people. And so the one figurehead for each of the nations that would decide the, the fate of the rest. Right. Uh, and you see this in other places too. But of course, the, this, this all will, will draw us eventually to Jesus, he who is the right. second or the last Adam, uh, the true man, and also the head, the, the head of the human race. Uh, of the new human race, uh, redeemed in his body and in his blood. As the head, so the body. Yep, yep, for the resurrection. And, you know, that's really important, yeah. Because mm -hmm. then, because then, it, like you say, just like you just said, the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So if you're a member of the body of Christ, then what happened to the head will happen to you. Yep, yeah. yep. And so all the, that promise comes down to you as well. And, and that's really where the whole theo the theology of family is informed by that. Uh, in the Christian faith, uh, the understanding of a head of the household and the whole family um, be walking in step with the head of the household, the head of the household walking as a servant among his family. Um, yeah, also then I would say the theology of the nation. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's something to think about, um, perhaps. I, I, certainly with nation understood ethnically. Where where nation is understood as sort of like, um, where, where nations are understood as a, as as a conglomeration of families mm -hmm. who have some kind of, you know, common ancestor. Right. Yeah. Right. Not necessarily modern nations as we know them, but uh, tribe, mm -hmm. more tribe. Yeah. All right. So uh, it's pretty straightforward. Anything else that we should notice there in chapter eleven, Pastor? Uh, again, just the highlight in verse 7 that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Yeah. And, and so that, again, is a constant thread woven throughout Scripture, how God chooses one nation um, to ultimately bless all the nations of the world. God had chosen Jacob ultimately to bless Esau, and he, is, he has chosen Israel ultimately to, blessing, to be a blessing upon all the nations. Uh, and this will be something the prophets will pick up on again. Because Israel, as we know, once they do get to the promised land, they fail miserably in being that light in mm -hmm. the midst of the darkness, being a blessing upon the nations. And so it works both ways. You know, this, um, this imagery of leaven in dough, mm -hmm. and it comes from the Old Testament. Uh, one, one bit of leaven uh, will affect the whole lump. And, um, and then Christ also saying, you know, the king of heaven then is like leaven. He actually uses, he, he kind of twists that around. Um, 
but that that would be the expectation of Israel is that Israel then becomes mm-hmm. the leaven of the whole nation, or I mean of the whole world, uh, and that ultimately happens through Christ, mm-hmm. yep. Christ Jesus. Yep. But even though Israel failed, yeah. the new representative, the true representative of Israel, Jesus Christ, he right. succeeds. All right, well, let's read chapter 12. This is called the Passover. So have you ever heard of the Passover, uh, the Jewish holiday, where they, which they celebrate at the same time around Easter because Christ was crucified and raised around Easter, so we celebrate Easter around the same time as Passover. Uh, this is what it's all about. This is what they are commemorating at that celebration. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But when what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. All right. Um, So... Is, is, is a memorial day, is a commemoration of this event. And so certain features of the Passover are designed to recall um, that, the, that this is the day the Israelites are going to be let out, that this are going, going to be delivered um, so that they can be let out. And that's why it says you have to eat it in haste. Mm-hmm. So you, can't, you can't sort of luxuriate over this feast. Uh, and you need to eat it dressed and ready for a trip. So it's sort of like, you know, today we might say you need to eat it, um, you know, with your shoes on and your coat on um, and, and, and with your backpack or something. Um, and so imagine eating that way. But that was the point was that um, this, is a, this, is, this is journey eating. This is eating in order to go out with the Lord. 
And so also the unleavened bread, because leaven, leavened bread is more likely to be corrupt, corrupted, to go badly, to mold, but unleavened bread less likely to do so. And so no unleavened bread within the houses of Israel, because the houses of Israel are to be uncorrupt, they are to be pure, they are to be holy to the Lord, and they're to be ready for a trip. And on a trip, you want bread that's going to last for a long time. Of course, we see that and we, we look forward to the, the everlasting bread, mm -hmm. the bread that lasts forever. You know, that helps us understand that phrase, the bread that lasts forever. It's the bread that not only lasts for this journey, but for the entire journey, um, the entire future that we have with God in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But uh, but anyway, the lamb, I mean, here it is, the yeah. lamb of God. And so when you read the book of Exodus, especially this part, but just Exodus in general, uh, this will help you understand all the more, especially John's gospel, because you right. hear a lot of those echoes of Exodus in the gospel of John. Uh, like in John chapter 6, where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall mm -hmm. have no part of me. Uh, certainly hearkening back to, to some of this. Although they don't drink the blood here. Right, they use the blood. That's but, the stunning part of that. Right. Yeah. But they are used to use, they are to use the blood to put over the doorposts. And right. so we do hear, for example, John the Baptist right away in John's Gospel saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, how does the Lamb of God takes, take away sin, the sins of the world? Uh, by virtue of his death, by his blood being poured out of his ribbon side. And so that, that it's kind of... Um, assumed in that in that wordage, that verbiage of Jesus, of Jesus being the the Lamb of God, and, and death passes over those who are in Christ because He has been raised from the dead, mm -hmm. and because He has died for the sins of the world, and so death has no control, no power over those yeah. who are in Christ, in His body, and in His blood. Yeah, and yeah. Jesus visits Jerusalem three times, uh, three Passovers in John's yeah. Gospel. So. So when you hear about these festivals mentioned, uh, particularly in John's Gospel, you get a fair dose of that in Exodus, why these celebrations were celebrated thousands and thousands of years ago, and why they find their fulfillment uh, in, in the work and the person of Jesus. Right, and his, the manner of his crucifixion, I believe it's uh, his uh, crucifixion in, in John, it, the point is made that it's at the time that the... Uh, the lambs are going to the lambs start being prepared mm -hmm. for sacrifice as well. Um, yeah, it's that Passover language is so people sometimes think of the Gospel of John as sort of being Greek and not Jewish, but it's actually extremely Jewish, perhaps even more Jewish than we mm -hmm. you oh, know definitely. than we see in some other Gospels because of that. Partly because of that interest in the Passover imagery, uh, Seder meals. Now, you, because, you know, we talk about some Christians have really participated in things like Seder meals. A Seder meal is a sort of a recreation or a reconstruction of the Passover meal. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that this likely wasn't much like a Seder meal. I mean, I've been to a Seder meal. Needless to say, no one is um, holding a staff in their hand. Getting ready to leave. Getting ready to leave. Yeah. No. Um, but also the Seder meals really were something that, that came into existence after the fall of the temple um, in 70 AD, which was about 40 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so after, after Jesus, uh, the Seder meal really developed into what it is today as part of the Passover. So sometimes people, Christians, you know, want to have those Seder meals as, a, as an attempt to understand this. I mean, yeah, probably there's some understanding gained from that, but it's good to remember that those things are really a later reconstruction. This is very, very simple. This is, you roast the lamb, you eat it quickly, whatever's left over you burn, you have unleavened bread. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. This is sort of like the equivalent, I don't know, bread and cheese, for, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a quick sandwich. Mm -hmm. Sausage and cheese wait. for the road. Yeah, sausage and cheese for the road. Yeah, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, uh, a unblemished, an unblemished lamb, so a, a spotless lamb, um, and and also a lamb that is shared then among the households. Uh, there is this is a truly communal gathering, and so if your household's too small, then you share a lamb mm -hmm. with your neighbors. 
And we, that's going to become an ethic that will become repeated throughout God's uh, provision of and ordering of the promised land, that it will be a place where bounty is shared and where each is concerned for his neighbor. And again, that points ahead to the life of the church where they held all things in common and no one had anything had any need or anyone who had need was provided for by that early church as described in the book of Acts. Um, and, and then he commands that this shall be the beginning of months for you. Now, as my understanding is that, you know, there, as often will happen, you know, in, in the Jewish faith today, there's Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year, the beginning of the year, but that is not Passover. No, Rosh, that's that tied to Yom Kippur, which is mm -hmm. uh, more of a fall, yeah. September, October thing. So there can be sort of two, you know, that, this will often happen within a, a community that is sort of two years. Yeah. We're talking about the beginning of the fiscal year as opposed to the beginning of the calendar year, when the same way in the Christian church is the beginning of the liturgical year, which is the beginning of Advent, and then we have the beginning of the secular year. Mm -hmm. um, there can be, there's, there's, there's a couple of different senses in which this is the beginning of the year. This is the beginning of their identity. This is the beginning of their grand adventure with God. Um, but then other, other developments would, would occur within their liturgical cycle, their religious year. But still, the fact that he says this is to be the beginning of the year for them indicates how central this is mm -hmm. for their identity as Israel, we are the people whom God delivered from Egypt and whose firstborn he spared mm -hmm. through the blood of a lamb. And that ultimately becomes the identity of the church. We are those whom he delivered from slavery into sin and death because he did not spare his firstborn, as it were. He did not spare his beloved son. And yet by that beloved son's blood, we are spared. Other comments that you would offer here, Pastor? Uh, I, I think there's definitely some significance in verse 6 of when this whole assembly of when, when they shall kill their lamb, the, mm -hmm. the lamb shall be slaughtered at twilight. twilight. So there's something about the timing of this that's it's very, uh, very important. Of course, twilight is the beginning of the... New day. The, yeah, the beginning of the new day here. And, and so again, getting at that new identity... Of, of the people of Israel. You were slaves in Egypt, but now you are those who have been redeemed by my omnipotent right. hand. I am the, as Moses and Miriam will sing a little bit later in chapter 15, this, this is the Lord who is the warrior who is, who is going to fight for you. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we see after the Passover is that Israel, they, they essentially do nothing um, except do what the Lord commands them to do. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's certainly the, the obedience there, but, but God does all the heavy lifting. They, they are the ones who simply relish in the victory that's being won and, and fought for them. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like, you know, when you see those pictures of uh, in the aftermath of World War II, when World War II was officially done and over mm -hmm. with, and then you see all these celebrations like in New York with the Navy guy embracing his beloved and and you know those he didn't actually know her oh really yeah the, the bigger story that just that's, that's totally funny. tangential uh they didn't know each other <laughs> oh really he just grabbed her and kissed her oh that's funny yeah they did track him down anyway oh that's that's wild yeah. um but yeah i mean they they weren't they i mean the, the navy guy or whatever branch of the military he was in he wasn't there when they signed that peace mm -hmm. deal uh he might have served we don't know mm -hmm. but all those people in new york celebrating or wherever that was i'm guessing it was new york or something i think it was new york um, but, you know, they were celebrating the victory, even though they themselves likely did not participate in that. Many of them didn't. Mm -hmm. Some of the military men might have. Um, and so Israel is doing this, too, that they are celebrating this event that they have certainly suffered through much. But God is the one who's doing all, all of this. He is, he's poured out his wrath. He has demonstrated his power, his sovereignty. Uh, he is the one who's delivering them. He is the one who will split the sea. He's the one that will bring it crashing down. Mm -hmm. He's the one who will provide manna and quail mm -hmm. in the wilderness. He is the one who will also get upset because his people, even though he gives them freedom, they kind of miss being slaves. Yeah, right. Right. That's a very real dynamic yeah. still for us today. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. We keep wanting to run back into slavery and stop thinking like free men. As it were. As a pig returns, as a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool return to his folly. Folly, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great application of that verse. And um, also, as you were talking, 
Um, that made me think about how he says, whoever does not do this will be cut off from the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, God, you know, we look at that and we think, oh, he's being, you know, really kind of hard there. But, but God wants his people to dwell in his mighty works. That is their identity. Uh, to dwell in what he has done for them. Mm -hmm. And so to be cut off here is not that they aren't doing something as much as the fact that God has done something and he wants that to so shape their identity and their life that they will rest in its power and in its promise. And that's why there's this threat of being cut off mm -hmm. from the people of Israel if they don't do that. Um, God insists on being the gracious giver God, not the God um, who, who sort of sits passively by as we do things for him, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. Well, let's finish up just a little, a little bit part, a little bit more of this chapter, or this, yeah. a little bit more of this chapter, up until the plague actually comes. So starting at verse 21 and going through to verse 28, Pastor, would you read that for us, please? Yep. Then Moses called all their elders, all the elders of Israel, and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep his service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, what we might ask ourselves, why is this not being done today by, um, by Jews? And I, 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 and, and maybe I'm not, knowing the full picture there. So I don't want to speak with too much certainty. Um, but one, one thing to remember is that today the Jews don't have the temple and there was a further command coming later that no sacrifice shall occur outside of the temple. Without the temple, no sacrifices can be done. This is one reason why, why very Orthodox and uh, Jews want to see the temple rebuilt. So the sacrifices can again be offered to Yahweh. But whether or not that's the case, this was to be a perpetual memorial. The blood would be put on the doorposts as a remembrance of what God did. Blood and remembrance go together. Blood and proclaiming the mighty acts of God go together. So it comes as no surprise to find blood also at the heart of the Christian religion as it is poured out for us at the Lord's altar for his people, because it is there then that we are strengthened in that trust. Uh, as a memorial, it's done, it says, as a remembrance, what is that but faith in the strengthening of faith? It is for the sake of strengthening faith that the memorial is held. And so when Christ says, do this or this do in remembrance of me, this do in remembrance of me, that's where the accent, that's where the focus falls in that term on the this. This do in remembrance of me. He's saying this do in that faith of me. This do um, in, in, in trust, trusting that this is done for you and trusting all that I have indeed done for you. And that already is an ethic we've seen built up here then for the people of, of Israel. And, you know, hyssop, we'll see hyssop later. Right? Where do we see hyssop later, Pastor? Right, when the hyssop, uh, the branch of hy hyssop, yep. hy the hyssop branch is used to bring uh, the sour wine to Christ. To Jesus' mouth. Yeah, and so there's a little bit of a Passover connection there mm -hmm. as well. 
You were looking up something. So what are you looking up for us? Yeah, I was looking up uh, Romans chapter 5 because Romans mm. chapter 5 talks about that, right. the blood uh, of, of Jesus and uses it. You know, it I'll just read it for you. Starting, sure. at, starting at verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and following. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, verse 9, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received now reconciliation. And so there again is, um, there is salvation, reconciliation, uh, but also there is blood and, and there is wrath. And so the blood um, assuaging the wrath of God, pushing that, ricocheting that away uh, from, from, from us, uh, just like in the Passover, the blood of the lamb being a sign for the destroyer um, mm -hmm. to, to leave the houses of Israel alone. So that brings me to, my ne to the next question then, Pastor, verse 23. Mm -hmm. um, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house. Who is the yeah. destroyer? What is... What is yeah. Who is this destroyer? You know, traditionally, uh, angel of death, right? Yeah. Traditionally, the the angel of death, the one, the the angel means messenger, servant, and yeah. yeah, servant. And so we don't angelos. Uh, we do, and so we don't want to probably um, get too much into sort of a cosmology here of imagining who the angel of death is in particular. But it's, it may not even be a particular angel mm. of death. It's just the messenger or the angel whom God sends right. for this purpose. The one who exacts the, whoever they are, that's, that's yeah. their job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, one can imagine, you know, just like in the military, us people, people, different recruits can have different jobs on different days. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, that might be the case here too. It, it, we're not really let into right. that question too okay. much. Yeah. Uh, and, and when we look at the New Testament, you know, Mary, Joseph, good Jews, they knew their scriptures. Yeah. And, and so when, when an angel of the Lord appeared to them, um, you know, in modern day, we kind of have this very tame image of angels, very fair skinned and very peaceful flying wings, harps and, and whatnot. Um, but these fiery creatures, these, these servants of the Lord, uh, would often come in judgment. And so it wasn't always a good sign when an angel was there. Adam and Eve, they tried, they looked back at the Garden of Eden and they couldn't go there because the angel with the, with the flaming sword, right? right? Uh, and so it, it was always, it was a scary thing to behold a, mes a messenger of the Lord, an angel. Mm -hmm. um, it would, it would, that's why they always say to, to Mary, to Joseph, to John in, in the book of Revelation, right? Do not fear. <laughs> yeah. Don't fear. We're here to bear good news to you, not judgment, but to, to, to bring you the good news of, of great joy that to you this day shall be born um, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So, And the Israelites become angels here in a way. They become messengers to their children. Mm. Each new generation of what God did for the people of Israel in Egypt. So uh, there's a concern here for this being passed on to the next generation. Every gener This isn't just for the generation that experienced it to remember it. This is for every generation to remember it uh, with the conviction then that this is the same God. We still have the same God who is our God, our Lord, the one who serves us and whom we also serve. And what a great comfort that is. So let this be a time for us to then also reflect on the value and the importance of turning the year into a cycle of telling the mighty acts of God uh, so that we punctuate the year. And of course, that means certainly a daily telling of the story, but also a yearly telling of it because those types of uh, liturgy, liturgies, those types of rituals, ceremonies help teach the story help inculcate 
the knowledge of God's mighty works. So that's why we celebrate the birth of Christ, the baptism of Christ, the transfiguration of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, this is why we also remember things like the Reformation in the fall and the Feast of Reformation or All Saints Sunday or the different Saints Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, this is really valuable for the younger generation. This helps steep them. It isn't, it isn't a slam dunk for creating faith. We know that there's no slam dunk of what we can do to create faith. That's a, a gift in the hand of God. But at the very least, they'll know the story. Mm -hmm. They'll know what God has done. That will be active in their life. Um, so that it's, you know, they, they, so that, so the scriptures are tactile in a way. The scriptures are experienced, something you can feel. Mm -hmm. So it affects your time. Yeah. One of our seasoned saints of Zion, she relishes in that opportunity to be able to share the story um, with her, I believe, great grandchildren every Easter, oh, yeah. every Christmas. Yeah. Um, you know, they would gather around great grandma, grandma, mm -hmm. great grandma, and, and that would be her thing. You know, they, she, let these this new generation know who Jesus is yeah. uh, and what he had done for them. And so, again, uh, we give thanks to God for those faithful moms and dads mm -hmm. and grandmas and grandpas and great-grandmas and great-grandpas and, and godparents who, who do that very thing, letting the younger generations yeah. know about the mighty acts of God. Yeah, indeed. Well, let us pray. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we rejoice and give thanks for all of your mighty works. We bless you for your deliverance of the Israelites from the angel of death and from the bondage of slavery. And as we praise you for these mighty acts, we remember also and especially the Passover of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you have secured for us an everlasting deliverance from the bondage to sin, death, and the devil. Grant, O Lord, that his gospel would always be our bread on which we feed the strength of our faith, the nourishment of our hope. Grant, O Lord, that as he has now become our everlasting bread, so we would feast ever and daily upon this promise. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I'll let you turn it off here. Yep.